Maso, a husband, video game lover, former Disney cast member, and an owner of a wonderful dog. In fact, that is the dog right there. Her name is Balana. For those of you that get the reference, um, congratulations, you're 82. And I am also the treasurer of Open Source Matters. Anyone here familiar with what Open Source Matters is? Uh, Open Source Matters is the foundation of the Joomla project. So this is usually when people throw stuff at me. So I volunteer in both projects. Open Source is my love. Open Source is one of the most amazing things that we have available to us. Uh, and it doesn't matter what tool you use. That's one tool. There we go. It doesn't matter what, uh, what tool you use. If you use WordPress, that's great. Everyone still hear me? That's good. If you use WordPress, that's great. If you use Joomla, that's great as well. Whatever tool you want to use, it's perfectly fine. If you are a lover of WordPress, that's amazing. I recommend you go to a JavaScript meetup. Maybe go to a Node.js meetup. Even if it's not in your Word app, in your real house, you're going to be able to learn something from that meetup. So whatever tool you want to use is perfectly great, and I am going to talk about WordPress and specifically in testing. But I don't think it's okay to shit on people just because they might use a different tool. We have our preferences. It's an amazing tool. That's great. But sometimes going to a Node.js conference or a Drupal conference, there's business tracks, there's design tracks. There's always something that you can take out of any of these communities. And really, the closed source, the SaaS solutions, that's our big threat to us. It's not. We're not fighting with each other. Our competitors are not Drupal and Joomla. It's Wix, Rebus, Wix. Um, what do I do as an evangelist? I travel around the world and I talk to people. I talk to people like you. I do community full time. Um, I try to give education talks that's useful and helpful to different people. Um, for example, I was in Salt Lake City a couple months ago and it was a DIY mommy blog conference. And this is a picture that I kind of to see of the unicorn party that they do in Salt Lake City. So I definitely get around and do all sorts of things. We're here to talk about uh, AD testing, and no one has a mic, so this is where we're going to first start with some of our interactive portion. So, raise your hands. Who here has done AD testing before? Okay. Um, just pick anyone with hands up. Okay. So, can you tell me, what's your name? Is this on? Oh, there we go. Steve. Steve. And can you tell me a little bit about your AD testing experience? Sure. So, um, I mean, it's really about, uh, it's a very broad question, right? Um, it's really about uh, finding two experiences that, in general, are similar enough to be easily compared. Uh, but I've actually also done it for two experiences that were radically different, where we had one product and then we, uh, we launched a uh, an equipment product, but one that was entirely different but sent percentage of the traffic to one of the experiences and another percentage of the traffic to the other experience. And we were able to basically prove out a very significant benefit to this newer experience based on the AP testing. But in general, you can use it for small or more incremental changes. And I've used um, Monotape before we do that, which is a big enterprise uh, platform. Um, and I'm actually interested in learning about uh, more accessible platforms that probably more people who aren't uh, part of large organizations would have the ability to use. Cool. Awesome. So, and just one other example. Can someone give me an example of just an experience that you had when you tried to, when you did an AD test with a client? Maybe a specific client example. They would have one that they want to share over here. Yeah, I was able to uh, read testing some different prompts for a donation form. Cool. So I'm just going to repeat that so it's on the mic. Uh, basically, you're trying a couple different prompts on a donation form to see which ones had a better response and maybe converted more. Okay, cool. So those are some great examples. So basically, A-B testing, um, a lot of people look at it from this version. Has anyone ever changed a bunch of stuff on a site or a client site? You're like, I changed this, 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 and this, and my sales went up, my sales went down for my client, and I have no idea why. 
I changed 20 things, and I have no idea which of those 20 things made the change. You know, and then I'm going to change another 20 things to try to make it go up. Has anyone had, had a client who kind of done similar things? You just keep throwing and see what paint sticks on the wall? That is usually what people think of as A-B testing, where they think, I can't afford it or it's not good with me. A-B testing is one of the best things you can do to make residual income, make more money, and make more client money for your clients. So the first thing I talk about is A-B testing is control. It's control. We have to make sure we know what we're testing. We have to make sure it's in an environment that is statistically sound. So with that, we change one thing at a time. A lot of people um, don't know the difference between multivariate or single variant testing. I recommend single variant testing unless your site can have lots of traffic, and I mean thousands and thousands and thousands of visitors. Otherwise, you're not going to get the traffic to have it be useful. And with that, you have to have it be statistically relevant. What I mean by that is there's a margin of error for every A-B test you do. There is. Does anyone here um, have a doctorate in um, data analysis? No? You don't? How are you web designers? How do you guys have clients? Yeah, nobody does, right? It's not a thing that we have in our industry. But it's something that we don't, we take for granted. A lot of times we look at statistics, say, okay, I did A, I did B. B, went, B sold five more, so B's better. But if you look at all the different variables, such as time of day, holiday, seasonality, um, browser, you know, visitor pass, repeat visitors, cookie history, it actually might be in the margin of error. So there's tools out there to help you know if it's in the margin of error or not. There's some hosted tools out there like VWO, which stands for Visual Website Optimizer, um, or Optimizely, and there's some other ones out there. And this is like usually when people ask, Hey, what WordPress plugin do you use for A-B testing? My answer is actually I don't use any WordPress plugin for A-B testing. There's some great ones out there, but you have to be very, very careful because a lot of the WordPress plugins for A-B testing will still be cached by Google. So you have to know how to reroute your robots file, and you have to know how to make sure that they're not different URL paths, make sure it's not in the sitemap, and all of this other stuff. And for most small businesses and most website agencies, quite frankly, they forget something I find. And then it hurts their SEO or it hurts their ranking or whatever the case is. What's nice about Optimizely or VWO, and there's lots of other options out there, you can Google and find which one fits best for you, is that it's all JavaScript based. You just put a JavaScript in your theme file and it loads on the fly when your page loads, which means you can code your test with no coding needed at all, which makes it very um, easy to do. We're also going to talk about some examples of some of the um, different tests that I've done. Um, first of all, everything I'm showing you here, I've done for Fortune 500 companies. So, we talked about micro-testing. Test one thing at a time. Don't do uh, multivariate testing unless you have enough traffic to do it. And I'm talking about Fortune 500 brands that I still don't um, always do multivariate testing on when I've done that for them. So basically, pick one thing and stick with it. Um, if you change 20 things on a page, you don't know which of those 20 things makes a difference. And here's where a lot of people think, well, it's a, it's, it might be a combination, and you're correct. Combinations do matter. But for most people to start with, they start with single changes, see what those changes do, and then maybe put those changes together to see if you get the holy grail. Because this is how you have to look at it. This is how you have to look at A-B testing for a client. For, um, a little bit more of an interaction time. Uh, has anyone here um, done a client project recently for maybe a small business that they're willing to be put on the, on the hot seat for just a couple questions? Anyone? Does that have to be about A-B testing? No. The guy in the green right here? So tell us a little bit about the project, just you know, 30 seconds about the client and what you did for them. Uh, it was a uh, startup company that uh, is building out home delivery program for okay. school lunches for preschoolers. Okay, so home delivery for preschoolers. Now, when you made the project, did you set goals for the project? They had their own uh, sales goals. Okay. In terms of uh, conversions uh, by certain dates. It was more tied to their financing and their marketing plan. Uh, but all in all, it was uh, a little bit challenging because the actual development process. Sure. 
but there was documented goals that said if we hit X by X date, this is a successful project. Excellent. Um, that's a great example of a specific goal. Now, who all does that? Who sits down with the client and says, hey, a year from now, what will make this project a success? Who sits down with that client? So who's had the honeymoon period? Where the client loves the new designs, the best thing ever. Six months later, the website's not doing enough. It's not making enough money. It's not what I expected. And all of a sudden, those pretty designs that you did were thrown out the window. Has anyone experienced that with a client? Yeah, probably a few of us. It happens quite a bit. Because we don't sit down and say, hey, Mr. Client, let's agree. Let's agree with the goal of this site is. Every site has a goal. It might be sales, it might be context, it might be stickiness, it depends. You have to be able to look back at a year from now and say, yes or no, binary, this succeeded the goals of the project. Because your goal is residual income, and we are building for our clients. And here's the thing that I think a lot of times we don't ever we worry about. We're too focused on going down to the next client, next design, next new thing, next shiny thing. And we think we know best. Designers are very smug. We think we know everything. Here's the, here is the little hidden secret about website design that nobody talks about. We're guessing. That's all we're doing. Every website we put out the door is a guess. We do not know every single client scenario out there. You might think you know what the best practice is for the web. You might think that this works better um, because of this case study or this case study or this experience. And those experiences are valid. You know, white papers are very valid. But every user base is different. I'm going to give you some extreme examples um, of some clients that I've worked with. But here's the thing: is we're not you're not building for your client. You're building for your client's users. And unless you understand those clients' users 100, percent and nobody can, because they change. The attitudes change. The education changes. The way they interact with the site changes. Do they use mobile? Do they not use mobile? Whatever the case is. So we have to make sure that we understand these clients. And that's why I recommend micro-testing, so that we can just look at one thing at a time. So, what to test? Can anyone give me some examples? You can just shout them out, we don't need to run for a mic. Of uh, things that you could test, like you could do A-B testing on the site. Checkout. Forms. Buttons. Sorry, what? Headlines. Headlines. Copy. Call to action. Layout. Layout. Header. Yeah, pretty much anything, right? Some of that, you know, it's pretty some of the stuff out there, like buttons. You can do a lot with buttons. The color of the button, the tech, what the button says, how big it is, what cheap it is. I once had an insurance company. They had a quote for get a quote, get a quote now for this insurance, national insurance company. And we tested everything. We tested what the button says, 15 second quote, instant quote, and policies as low as blah, blah, blah. We tested layout, we tested different stock images, we tested this, everything you can think of, 80 different tests, 80 different tests, and they all are in the margin of error. You know what increased that conversion 80% more? A two pixel drop shadow. And I have millions of visitors to prove this, going through this, going through this site. So don't say that we think the little things don't matter because they do. And it's a big combination of every set of users is completely different. I had a client, they were, you know, they were a national brand. Um, they had a sub-brand. That sub-brand was owned, um, he was given to the owner of one of our client's sons to manage, who was just out of college. He was convinced it was a household product. He was convinced college students were the biggest demographic for this, for this product. And all of the marketing wanted to be focused on that. I want frats, fraternities, and blah, 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 blah. We started looking at the data. There was just not a single school visiting the site. There was not a single college IP. You know who was? Single family mothers. Because it was a household staple that he just had this mindset, had had this edgy end on it. But it was also a natural product. It was also green. It also was one of those ones that was like a give one, take one thing, like Tom's shoes. It appealed to them. So we started doing A-B testing around that, and guess what, their sales went up. Don't think your user, what your users tell you, is, a, is who's visiting the site, because a lot of times, they're out of touch themselves, because they're too close to the business, and we're too close to our own biases. 
So buttons, lots of things you can test on buttons. Text. You can test tons of stuff on text. What the text says, the copy, the font, the size, if the text is clean or not, if it's paragraph. If it, you know, I've, I've seen some sites that have done very well by purposely putting the spellings in text and copy. It's, the stuff's out there, and we'll give some kind of crazy examples in a little bit too. Images. So many things you can do with images. Stock images, non-stock images. Show of hands, who uses stock images? Okay. And another show of hands, who refuses to use stock images? Of those people, who's a photographer? <laughs> so here's the thing, is there's no right or wrong answer. I have people like, you know what, I only use stock images because that's all my clients can afford. Okay. I don't use stock images because I, I feel like some, you know, it, it doesn't feel authentic or whatever the case is, or it maybe I want my stuff to be custom and my clients are looking for that very hands-on, you know, 100% organic experience. That's valid too. There's no right or wrong answer. Every set of users is different. There are some demographics that respond really well to stock images. It's insanely well. In fact, if it's not a stock image and it doesn't have that stock image look, it doesn't convert as well. There are other ones that they get turned off. They can tell it's fake. They can tell it's not organic. There's no right or wrong answer. It all depends on how we test it. And here's the thing, is that we can test everything on the site. And you can make money doing it. You're the, this is how I explain it to my clients. Your website is a magic, magic money machine. Those are the exact words I use, magic money machine. And, our, and if, I get, if you put in a dollar in that magic money machine and I can prove you get two dollars out, how many dollars will you give me? I make an answer. They laugh that I make them answer. And then they sell, they say, well, unlimited dollars. That's what we want to hear. Because if we can statistically prove, statistically prove when you're moving the needle in the right direction every single month, there's no reason they'll ever cancel from you. Because you've agreed on a goal. Make it a smart goal. Specific, measurable, attainable, and timely. You know, because of a time limit. If you can hit those every month consistently, why would a client ever cancel? It's when we don't set expectations ahead of time. We just are so convinced the client wants a new site, but we don't ask them, why do you want a new site? Why do you want that? It's like we take the client at face value and are writing them a prescription before we even hear, hear what the ailments are. Doctors don't do that, but a lot of what we still kind of do, because we think it's kind of cool, you know? We think it's cool to make fun stuff, and it is. But we're servicing those clients' bottom line, and they're servicing their clients. And for those of you who think the crazy stuff doesn't work, tell your story. Go back to the political campaigns. Um, yes, this is where I talk about some examples of both uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. First, Hillary Clinton. She did A-B testing, as best as we can tell, testing different call to actions for lots of things. But we're going to focus on donations right now. One of her, they tested things like what the website is, like do you have a box to fill in how much you want to donate, do you have pre-selected buttons, whatever the case is. They, one of their ones that I, they kind of stuck with is the one that no matter what you click, it defaults to like a, a slightly higher amount, and then you can edit it on the next page. Okay, a little bit concerned. Let's look at Donald Trump. Donald Trump, as best as we can tell, because they don't release these specific numbers, the most successful fundraising campaign of Donald Trump the week before the election, he did a thing. Give money, get your name on my site, a little Facebook feed. Okay, sure, I get what he's doing. And people feel like they own some of the campaign, right? Can anyone guess how you might technologically do that if you were hired by the Trump campaign, that people donate, have their name appear on their website, Facebook page? Anyone have a technical example about how you might want to do that? No. There's lots of ways, right? You could have fa fancy video, you could do JavaScript, you could do feeds, all this stuff. Make it very nice and polished. You know what they did? Did anyone guess what they did, how they, how they accomplished this? Uh, can someone repeat that a little louder? Oh, just put every name in like a list? Yeah. So this is what he did, and I'm not making this up. A live webcam of a laser printer. <laughs> this is literally what they did. This wasn't a pack. This wasn't third party. 
This was the official campaign. And here's where everyone laughed. Oh, ha, 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 they don't understand technology, blah, blah, blah. Listen, guys, they knew exactly what they were doing. The, the companies that they hire, the people that they hire for this are not idiots. They were going after a very certain demographic, and guess what? It worked. And every once in a while, they had a very high-tech hand come into the shop with a handwritten sign that said, donate at blah, 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 hashtag drain the swamp. Handwritten. This went on for eight hours. Eight hours. I couldn't turn it off. I was amazed that this was happening. But the thing is, they tried it before. They tried it for the, um, they tried it during the uh, convention. But that was a very highly produced thing. Get your name on the big board, things like that. You know, where it like zooms in on the stage and says thanks and lens flares and fireballs. I'm exaggerating, but a very, you know, you can imagine how, how that would look, right? Um, I don't know how successful that was, but they're going after a different demographic there. The attendees at the convention probably were a much different audience than the attendees that they were targeting for this campaign. So the crazy stuff works. And for those of you who don't necessarily believe that crazy stuff works, I'm going to go over just my list. I'm sure you would get a copy of this yourself give some crazy examples, but this stuff works. And don't laugh until you try it. Because this is where the designers in the room usually cringe. They're like, how can I do this? This goes against everything I wanted. But again, the client has a website for a reason. Our job is to service the client. Magic money machine. Now here we're going to talk about um, the duck. I got a duck up here, the, boss, the Boston Bluehead. <coughs> And I say, which way does your duck face? There was a study, I think it was HubSpot that did it, that said one facing duck converted eight, like 10 times less or six times less than the other facing duck. Yeah. Left versus right. Uh, now, the right facing duck turned out to convert more. Can anyone guess why that maybe was the case? Can you say that in the mic? It's right there. Does users read from left to right? People who read from left to right. A couple other ideas. People are looking. Like maybe pointing the call to action. Oh, uh, pointing into the page. Okay. Uh, yeah. Do you want to hold it up really close? Sure. Because of the spacing to the right, it looks like it's looking forward versus moving backwards. Looking forward? Yeah. Cool. And then last one? Because it was a fluke. Because it was a fluke. That's a very possibility too. That's why we test multiple sets of users. Um, but here's the thing. Um, and I, that's a very close answer to what um, the one that looking forward is. But every fourth talk, somebody says, because the duck is looking into the future. So. Um, that's a very close example. But here's the thing, here's the true reason. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. The minute you try to assign reason to why users interact and how they interact, you're going to drive yourself crazy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. Why do you get so obsessed with trying to understand why people do things? There are averages, yes, but every set of users is different. Let's focus on data. Data-driven decisions. If we focus on data-driven decisions, we are always going to help move the needle in the right direction because we're just doing what's helping best for our clients. It might work great for one client, but might not work well for another. Let's test it. And yes, loops happen. That's why um, when those systems, I recommend doing it until it tells you that it's past the margin of error. Some of those systems like Optimizely or VWO, some of the other ones will say, you haven't tested enough. Keep testing. And then when you get over a certain threshold, it's going to say, yep, this is good, apply this test and throw it out. Um, you can also maybe want to test it at different times of the year, things like that. But here's some of the things that um, I've tested, and I use all of these with uh, the clients I've worked on. I recommend when you do your monthly retainer, you know, let's say you have enough to do five A-B tests in a month, um, budget-wise, and do one crazy one. Because sometimes the crazy ones will be the pot of gold you never would have expected, and the other four will be more traditional based on your research and 
the analytics of what you think might be um, right for the site. So, um, professional versus unprofessional. Sometimes unprofessional sites work. They sometimes do. Um, I know people that um, you know make a lot of money on doing unprofessional sites. And for those of you who laugh to say nobody responds to that, has anyone ever gotten a fundraising letter that's like nine pages long and people cross stuff out and write in the margins? You know, you know, like oh, you know, things like that. People respond to that. They wouldn't send it out if it didn't work. Same stuff is true for the web. I know people that there are certain types of users, not many, but certain that respond better to Comic Sans. And here's the thing, guys, I want to be remiss not to say, is you're working with someone else's brand, you will want to focus on the data, you're just testing small subsets, I usually test 5% of their traffic, but it depends on your client, and say, but please get all tests signed off before you do it, but tell them, hey, we're just testing a small subset, it might be a miracle, but we just want to test it, and you have to work within the brand standards. But I've done, I've done all of these with Fortune 500. If, if you explain to the client what your goals are, you can usually get away with a lot more than you think you would. Photo versus illustration. You know, sometimes photos are great. Sometimes illustrations are great. You can find stock illustrations out there and make your own, or use a service like Fiverr, or get a local graphic designer if you don't have the skills to do it yourself. One color versus another color. That's very easy to do. What's also great to do with one color versus another color is test accessible colors. Um, this is an accessibility talk, but I highly recommend you look at the WCAG 2.0 AA accessibility standards, and you look at the color contrast percentages in that, and test your current site design contrast with one that is WCAG 2.0 contrast accessible, because usually it's going to make your rankings go up in general, because um, it's like one out of every eight adults have a disability that's covered under WCAG 2.0. So color is something you can easily test with contrast. A low brightness contrast versus high brightness contrast. Sometimes oversaturating a subject will do better results. Border versus no border. You know, very easy to test. Clear image versus blurry image. You know, what do you want to do? A static versus animated. You got static, and then you've got your animated there. It, just imagine it's going. Yeah, it's an infographic. Ugly versus sex appeal. Man, I've seen some amazing funnels that have just ugly people in them, and then there's a lot of websites that focus on normal looking people, which maybe don't have the sex appeal, but they're not on the other extreme of that too. So you can test that. Static versus interactive. Say you get 50% off, or you want a pizza or donut to get 50% off on. Uh, professional stock photos versus amateur and formal photos. And for those of you who can't do amateur and formal photos, there are professional stock photo companies that specialize in amateur looking stock photos. <laughs> it's true, it exists, look it up. So there's a service for anything out there. Cool. Um, one layout versus another layout. You know, one call to action versus another call to action. Images versus text only. Don't laugh, I've done it. Sometimes it works. No images, just a long funnel. Has anyone been to one of those direct response websites that is like a billion pages long, and has the testimonials and things like that? Those people aren't suckers that respond to that. Sometimes it's just people respond to different things. Thank you. Um, and we don't know what the user is going to respond to. That's why we should test it in a small subset first. Upright versus angle, button versus blur line text, regular border versus a false board and drop shadow. Custom ad design versus familiar UI elements. Now, if you do familiar UI elements, don't lie and don't try to trick anyone, but that's why we've seen a lot of UI elements being shared across popular apps and things nowadays versus custom design. Merit image versus original image, like our duck. One font style case versus another font style size case. Standard ad shape versus a custom ad shape, like a circle, border radius, or Nowadays, the circles to standard ad shape and the rectangles to custom ad shape. Positive versus negative. You want to fall in love with your spouse again versus sick of fighting with your spouse. I did a campaign for a company that serviced um, a product that was similar to Life, life Alert. Fall and I can't get up. We tested everything. You know what worked a lot of the times? Not the, oh, you're going to protect your family. It's your mom's going to fall down she's going to die. It's going to be your fault. There's a way to do this sensitively, and again, we, we laugh at some of the extremes, but sometimes negative response works better, and you can test it. Do 
generic versus relevant to the time period. Want a girlfriend? You can meet single women here or home alone on a Friday night or want a girlfriend by Christmas and it just happens to be Friday night or right around Christmas time? How do they know? Mention prices and discounts. Regular $20, 90% off versus leave it a mystery. Click here to add. Has anyone seen those add to cart to see the price things? You know? Um, there's a couple of reasons why that happens. One reason is they legally can't show so far below MSRP unless someone has the intent to buy. It's the old school. Our prices are too good to advertise. Come on to the showroom and find out. But a lot of times, it's just they want you to start the buying processes and get one click down into it. Uh, no trust logos versus trust logos. Um, by the way, if you ever have a client that uses a Better Business Bureau logo, please make sure they pay for the license. Just because they're listed or a member of the Better Business Bureau does not mean they have the legal right to use it on their website. You will, they will be sued and I've had clients have it. So there's a specific upgrade to the BBB membership and have that listed to the website. Uh, trust logos work for certain people. America, did anyone here watch America's Got Talent? A couple people. The most successful people that make money off that show are the people that put in their ad, probably see it, come see this comedian as featured on America's Got Talent. The majority of those people that put those tags in their posters are the losers in the first round that get laughed off the stage. They're not the finalists. Because you don't, people don't remember them. But they say, well, they're on America's Got Talent. They must be good. And they make a lot of money. But people not knowing who they are and having that logo on their, on their website or their page. Um, anyone here familiar with a company called uh, MyPillow? Well, I see the late night commercials. Yeah. Um, it's from my neck of the woods in Minnesota, Mike Lindell. Uh, um, former drug addict, trained pillow king. It's true, look it up. Um, full disclosure, I have a my pillow, I love it, but he had an A plus Better Business Bureau rating for years, and they built a whole campaign around it. So be careful with Better Business Bureau. Overnight, he went from A plus to F minus. The reasons don't matter, but his whole marketing strategy was thrown out the window because it was so tied to that trust. Um, you could, you know, there's you know, the reason why it happened is not really important. He basically broke the advertising guidelines, technicality, but no one, no user is going to pay attention to that. I'm not going to go through these too much, but these are weapons of influence. I'm going to show you how to get this whole thing, and all these slides are on slide share, so you can check them out on your own leisure. You know, but we're giving you a free trial versus or risk free trial. Scarcity, offer expires when that boss by last. Consistency, liking. Photos of real people. Social proof, 1 million satisfied customers, it's 2010. Authority, more doctors recommend this toothpaste than any other brand. Fun fact about toothpaste, do you know the main reason that the toothpaste that makes it work? is a silica that's in there, so it grinds against your teeth. You may know silica from those little packets that say do not eat. So, it's true, look at it. Um, appeal to the eight universal desires, you know, survival of life, enjoying the freedom beverages, Sexual companionship, um, living conditions, social appeal, keeping up with the Joneses, feeling pain, and both the five senses, use short words, ask a question, be controversial, all that stuff is ways of trying and testing. It all works. Now, playing to have fun. A B testing is a way you can make consistent money month after month and have so much fun with someone else's brand. I don't know why more people don't do this. It's some of the most fun I've ever had. And my clients are happy because they're making more money. And for those of you who think this isn't the future, is anyone here familiar with HubSpot? Marketing strategy? Yes, we're in Boston. Of course you're familiar with HubSpot. Thank you. Um, they started that. Um, anyone here at HubSpot agency at all? No? If you're a HubSpot agency, they're training their agencies now in a system called Growth Driven Design, GDD. It's done by Luke Summerfield, who's the director of education at HubSpot. All it is is starting a small site and doing continual improvements every month based on tests and experiments with data. Because they're saying you'll make more money in the long term by selling a site for $5,000 today, $2,400 a monthly retainer, or whatever it is, and they have a calculator, versus selling a $20,000 or $40,000 today. They're training their agencies to do this, and their agencies are making 60% more revenue annually than the ones doing the traditional model. And all they're teaching is A-B testing in a uh, similar thing. I recommend taking the training. It's free and public. You can search for growth driven design, HubSpot, you know, take it, it's really good. For those of you who want the book where I get some of my ideas from, um, it's this, this is a book called dotcom secretslabs.com slash free dash book. Again, these slides are in slideshare. 
and I'm going to show you how to go through the process. This is a book made by Russell Brunson from ClickFunnels. Um, anyone here watch the show uh, The Profit with Marcus Simonis? Yeah. The uh, Flex Watches episode, this was an internet marketing expert he brought in for the show. Um, he started from a direct response um, background selling supplements. His stuff is heavily focused on direct response advertising. So a lot of agencies are like, well, this doesn't work because I'm helping sell um, you know, delivery meals to daycares or whatever the case is. The ideas are in there. You have to look past the examples, but just fair warning. It is focused on a lot of the direct response, ebook, supplement industry stuff, but I still love the content. So you go to the site, you're going to see this, and I apologize, it's hard to, uh, this is small, like a screenshot. You fill out the form, you pay a little bit for shipping, go to the next page. You can, there's an offer, you can decline it unless you'd like the offer. Go to the next page. You see a little upsell video, you click down here if you don't want to buy whatever the offer is. Another upsell video, click down here if you don't want to buy what the offer is. If you click anything on this page, you would have bought something, so you can close that tab. And then you can unsubscribe from the email list if you don't like it. Again, I love his training. I think it does a really good job. Um, and I bought in a lot of that stuff, and I think it's valuable, but it's very heavily focused on direct response. So I would try with his free stuff before you do his paid stuff so you understand his style. Because it doesn't, some people can't look past that. So uh, with that, um, we have maybe time for one to two more questions, otherwise I'll be around. If you find me out in the hall, I'm here to talk all day. Um, but again, please have fun. A-B testing can make you money, and it's something that's just going to help your clients. So like maybe one quest one or two questions, if anyone has anything? No? Do you got something? Sure, so to quickly repeat, you're a designer, your company does new A-B testing, how can you convince them that it might be a good thing to do? Yes. I would focus on a small um, client example and say, hey, you know, let's use data and really go through the process of writing an experiment and having all the goals written down. There's some good tutorials out there if you find out, I'll be able to talk to you some examples. And just get a couple of small wins. If you can get a couple of little guesses and like, oh, this, this pebble is now turning into a small rock and getting a little bigger, if you can get to have them buy into just three month trial of just a small client, just do a little bit, then you'll be able to prove the monetary um, value long term. I also recommend taking the growth driven design training because that uh, helps you overcome some of the suggestions from a sales point of view. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate it. Find me if you have more questions.